And welcome back to Tridelphia Seventh-day Adventist Church for our online Bible study class. We are starting what, Pastor? We're starting a new lesson on the Gospel of John, one of the most beautiful Gospels and very different from the other three synoptic Gospels. Um, John does something that I think we will all enjoy, and it's kind of reflected also in the title of this New Quarters lesson, Themes in the Gospel of John. So, of course, before we dive into this lesson, I'm going to um, invite you to bow your heads with us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word again. We thank Amen. you for the Gospels, and we thank you for the book of John. As we study throughout this quarter, we ask that you would lead and guide in our studies. We ask that you would help our YouTube audience to be blessed and to get understanding and clarity to these portions of Scripture that we open. And we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to be with us and be our guide as we study. Thank you so much in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. All right, Pastor, could you read our Bible text for this week? Our Bible text for this week is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. There's uh, this kind of perspective that this whole lesson opens up with, you know, why did John write the gospel to start with? I mean, what's the purpose here? Um, was he trying to emphasize, like, Jesus' miracles? Um, was there some specific teaching of Jesus that he was going for? And... Like, what's the whole reason for writing this? So we're going to kind of take a look here. I'm surprised a little bit that the lesson uh, did not start at the beginning. I was like, oh, man, where's John 1? Because I really like John 1. John 1 is really a uh, beautiful kind of uh, thought process. And uh, then Pastor explained to me why. why so what's the, what's the purpose? Why are we not starting at the beginning here? So the author of this lesson, Dr. Tom Shepard, and I believe there's one more author, there are two of them this time, um, Edward Zinke as well. He's an author of, of, this, of this lesson. They decided to do it thematically. Basically, they're going to look at passages throughout the Gospels, of, in the Gospel of John, basically, and that are connected. And it looks like this week's lesson is connected to the word sign. That's going to be prominent mm -hmm. in each one of the stories that we read signs and basically that point the way that point to jesus so before we kind of dive into uh chapter two how it the lesson starts off with i just want to bring up two texts um one is um we have just kind of gone over that was the memory text i'm going to put it up here again that's uh john 20 verse 31 why is the purpose is that we may believe on jesus christ but there's also uh, John 21, verse uh, 25, and it says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And that's just kind of the end, the conclusion of John's thought process behind this. And you kind of, you hear people throw around that concept that, you know, if you really focus in on the life of Jesus, there's like no book that could just contain everything. That's right. And that kind of points back to this, this verse and this kind of theme here. But let's go and take a look at some of Jesus' early miracles. So we're going to start in John 2, and we're going to go uh, 1 through 11. So, Pastor, you want to start reading, and we'll just kind of go every other verse? Let's do that. So on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, 
What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to do, you do it. Now there were set six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. When the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So this is kind of like that entrance miracle, but it was super subtle. I'm not sure what the process was. There's a lot of like Jesus' childhood we don't understand or know about. There's just some of the significant portions we hear about. But somehow his mother, when she said they have no wine, was implying something more, like she knew what could happen. Um, and Jesus handles it very differently than like some people would. You know, he just kind of gently puts that comment in its place. But then he doesn't leave that request unfulfilled. So it's it's just an interesting concept of how Jesus handles the whole situation. Why why is it again, I know we've just jumped off the book of Mark and we were at the end of Jesus' life, but why are we not trying to speed up that process, that time, his time? Great question. Once again, Jesus came to fulfill what the prophets had revealed regarding the Messiah. And so there was not just the element of what the Messiah would do, but also the element when he would do it. And so this was for Jesus very important when he would be um, recognized as the Messiah. And so Jesus was very careful, we see this in the Gospel of Mark, to even reveal to those he was healing, to those he was feeding, who he was. He was trying not to make that um, the focus of the mission, but it seems like when the Messiah would basically appear and would be recognized by all, this is who he is, it was because it was the moment to give his life. And so he's like, my time has not come yet. So don't, don't, don't go there, mom. But then he went there. But he went <laughs> there, which is interesting. And, and he did it in such a way that the only people who really knew what happened were those who filled the jugs with water. Yeah. No one else. Oh. Um, and mom seemed to, or Mary, seemed to have had at least some, some reason to believe that Jesus could help in this situation. How? Mm -hmm. She wasn't worried. Just do what he tells you to do. That's all she told them. Whatever he says, you do it, and it's going to be fixed. So that, that's mm -hmm. powerful. That, that's already showing a, a bit of uh, faith. Correct. Um. And we could kind of go into all the aspects of what kind of um, blood of the grape this was or different things like this. But is there something more to this? Because, um, you know, on the surface, yeah, it's just turning water into grape juice. 
but it's like at a wedding. It's at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. What's the deeper lesson on this? Yeah, and, um, this is this is that's a good good question. Um, the deeper lesson again that we see here is that Jesus chooses to make this his first miracle at a moment, a very special moment in the history of this couple. It was their marriage. And it was something that God had also established from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. And what we see in this particular story again is that um, marriage is something that's very important to God. And if there's anything he could do to make this couple happy, God is open to doing it and, and making that feast be a a beautiful time, a memorable time for all those who came. Um, going back to verse 11, there's something that kind of just lightly stands out. Um, this manifestation of glory. You know, and what was the result of the manifestation of his glory? His disciples believed in him. Yeah, so some of this is mm -hmm. is for the disciples, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure why specifically they needed that, because mm -hmm. um, later we find out that just providing food for people is not what Jesus' mission is. You know, you think about the feeding of the 5,000 or the 4,000 or something, and the people are coming after him because he did that. We know that's not why Jesus did it, but I think Jesus was starting on the easy with with signs and wonders. Because if you start with the big stuff, it uh, could partially be off-putting, could partially um, corrupt the the minds that power that gl great glory and stuff like that um i don't think the disciples were ready for that but this was so subtle that it was just like um something to make them think and i just like to see um like it would be would have been great to see like what the how the disciples reacted to this and like the conversations they had because i'm sure they had some were able to try a little bit of it or something but um it's just watching that whole process from the behind the scenes this is kind of like the first thing and it was important enough to kind of mark be that ministry mark that John thinks it's important to place that in here. Um, Desire of Ages, the great book, I know we've mentioned that a few times in the previous um, uh, previous quarter um, with the book of Mark because it is on the life of Jesus. But it says, It was to honor Mary's trust and to strengthen the faith of his disciples that the first miracle was performed. The disciples were to encounter many and great temptations to unbelief. To them, the prophecies had made it clear beyond all controversy that Jesus was the Messiah. They looked for their religious leaders to receive him with confidence even greater than their own. They declared among the people the wonderful works of Christ and their own confidence in his mission. They were amazed and bitterly disappointed by the unbelief deep-stated prejudice and enmity to Jesus displayed by the priests and rabbis. The Savior's early miracles strengthened the disciples to stand against this opposition. So, like, they didn't need the signs and wonders to believe. They were already set in what they believed. So, it was just there to help empower them and strengthen that faith. Let's move to verse uh, chapter 4. So we get to sign number two, starting in uh, 
chapter uh, 4, verse starting in verse 46. Uh, if you want to start reading that. Glad to. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go your way, your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed in his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he came out of Judea into Galilee. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of a different perspective. And it's like we've, we've taken just the simple faith of Jesus' mother who had grown up uh watch Jesus grow up, grow up, you know, and seen him mature and the whole process and she she knew what was possible and had that faith. But now this take this takes this outside the family. And um this person had apparently heard um some thing significant about Jesus and was coming directly to him. And I guess there were other things that Jesus was doing, right? But this one turns into one of the signs. Um, what makes this aspect like significant here? This probably is, is, is once again an important part of Jesus' ministry in that he does this second sign again in Cana of Galilee. And what was prophesied by um, Isaiah the prophet was that the Messiah would come to this dark region of Israel. And the area of Galilee around the Lake of Galilee was in many ways considered a place where, you know, people were fairly simple. They were fishermen, they were farmers. And what good could come out of that region? You know, they're just, you know, they're the little people. And yet Jesus chooses to do all of his ministry in that region, the region of Galilee. And what's interesting about this as well is that the person who's being, who's asking Jesus to heal his son um, is a nobleman. And... This is someone who has heard of Jesus' power. He's heard somehow that he can also do miracles. And he goes, you know, normally the nobleman would expect somebody to come to him. Mm. Here you see him going to Jesus, yeah. humbling himself. And in some ways, um, being willing to believe um, in this person who heals and who could restore people back um, to to life. So it's it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, story of again Jesus. Um, you could say his his character, his glory as the Messiah. And one thing I like here is. Um... Jesus kind of puts up a smoke filter. Like, it's not just an immediate request granting, which is similar to what he did to his mother. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, you know, it's not my time. What, a, what, a, what do I have to do with this? But this situation is, unless you people 
which is <laughs> when you talk about you people, it's yeah. kind of like feels very finger pointing. Uh, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. Um, but uh, he reached through that um, that wall of separation and continued to implore and that's basically I, th I think it must have been surprising for him to just hear Jesus like comes right back at the request and go your way your son lives and it's just like what okay and I instead of being like no Jesus come come he just walked away and I don't know what he was thinking, but he got that confirmation soon. Like the next day, he bumps into his servants coming and he's like, Hey, what hour was that? And it was exactly the same time. And so it's just like, um, I guess that's when he really had the confirmation because verse 53 says, so the father knew that it was at the same hour which Jesus said to him. Your son. So it's like he had level one faith. He's just like, okay. And he took it. Uh, whether he, it to him, it meant that his son was going to get right well right then, or if it was going to be in the near future, he just took, took that as okay. Jesus is answering this request. But I think it happened a little bit quicker than he imagined it would. And it's just kind of a, uh, something surprising. And apparently that word got back to the disciples because it's written down as a story here. Because, I mean, even though the disciples may not have gone with him, maybe the servants went on and told them or bumped into the city later or thanking him or something like that for whatever reason. But I think it's interesting how Ellen White in Desire of Ages um, talks about the situation. You know, it, it talks about the man specifically. With an anxious heart, he pressed through to the Savior's presence. His faith faltered when he saw only a plainly dressed man, dusty and worn with travel. He doubted that this person could do what he had come to ask of him. Yet, his sorrow was known to Jesus. You know, before the officer had left his home, the Savior had beheld his affliction. He knew also that the Father had in his own mind made conditions concerning his belief in Jesus. Unless his petition should be granted, he would not receive him as the Messiah. And I think that's where Jesus saw through that. And that's why he put this, this, this kind of a first statement up. You know, unless you see signs and loves, you will not believe. Because he knew how he had just kind of set this up in his mind. And this says, while the officer waited in an agony of suspense, Jesus said, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. So it's just like such an awkward meeting. It, I feel like it's interesting because you see all these great miracles and everybody's like, wow. But you see stories like this and there's a lot of awkward and there's a lot of silence and there's a lot of suspense and there's the unknowing. You think of the, we talked last quarter about the uh, woman uh, coming to Jesus and him, him kind of pushing her away gently. And then, but her coming back with a, such a strong comeback that he's like, well, your faith is, has answered that for you. So what is this perspective from this um, um, individual and um, what is like from the woman coming to put in requests from Mary coming to put in requests? What do all these things teach you personally about like your intercession with Christ? Because Jesus doesn't change. He does. And in fact, what's so interesting about the Gospel of John is just the characters that come to Jesus. So in this case, in the first case, we had a mother who is requesting Jesus to do a miracle. Now we have a noble man, uh, you could say uh, an officer that, that was well regarded by the people, um, someone who had a high position. 
um, requesting Jesus to do a miracle. Um, in the next story, we'll see somebody who doesn't necessarily ask Jesus to do a miracle because he doesn't even know who Jesus is. But he mm. does complain to Jesus, you know, nobody's here to help me get into the pool. Yeah. Um, and yet what we see is Jesus came to help everyone, mm. especially those who felt um, they were the greatest sinners. That's who he came to help. Yeah, um, he was wanting to help everybody, but some people didn't see their need of being helped, and so they rejected Jesus. They said, "No, Jesus, we don't need your help." But those who were desperate, those who were in a situation where they had no hope, basically, and only a miracle, only a sign, would be able to help them. Those are the people that Jesus encountered, and so I think this lesson is going to just give us an opportunity to see. A variety of characters who, um, you know, were more on the rowdy side, were more uh, the the type you would not dare get close to. And yet mm. Jesus was looking for them, seeking them out, and finding them, and helping them. But how does it also affect you in your intercession? So like, that's, a, that's a great question. Well, looking though. at these yes. perspectives, because you have various versions of these people some of these people are like solid some of these people are like not even necessarily your maybe typical synagogue attenders you know it's just like you have this the spectrum of people asking and the way jesus responds to their request how does it shape the way you request and um <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> that's a great question Peter, and, and that tells me that I can come to Jesus just as I am. And I can make a request, and he can answer it right away. He might say, wait, or he might just tell me to do something unexpected, like go. And then like, yeah, but aren't you coming? I say, no, go, it's done. And, and that's where I think all of these in some way or another, they exercise faith. Mm, and faith yeah. is something that is critical for us to not only um, accept what Jesus has done, but then also accept to do what he's calling us to do in his power. Yeah. And, and that's how people then were cured of their diseases, when they had faith in Jesus' power. Not faith in themselves, not faith in others, but in Jesus and what he could do for them. So it's just working through this concept of developing your faith. Mm -hmm. And like Pastor Sam and myself, we're not, we have not arrived. Mm -hmm. We're still understanding, we're still struggling with the various things or challenges or trying to understand how God works in certain ways or how God moves the church or different things like that. And so even we are there asking God for faith because I feel like as humanity goes on and on in time, we get to this point where, you know, our minds and brain capacities aren't what they were back in the Old Testament times, That's you right. know, the closer you are to creation, I feel like they had an smarter, and, over us, smarter yes. and more intelligent. <laughs> and as as we go on in time, you know, the the curse of sin on and the unwellness of humanity has just gotten worse over time. So we're here, you know, asking in faith to believe. But the cool thing is, so here's your request. And here's your faith down here. And you're asking for this, but you can also ask for faith up here. Mm -hmm. And Jesus will not only give you this, but he will answer this according to his will. Mm -hmm. If that's what's best for the situation, that's how it's going to go. Or there's going to be something better, or there's going to be that, that waiting period. And, You'll have other situations where there's that waiting period or, or the, the times of trials and the unknowns. But just something to keep in mind is 
if you're struggling with something, you can always start at the basics and ask for faith to believe in the beginning, because sometimes that's where we need to start. Like we can have all these great dreams and aspirations and, and things of how we want to go or what we need, um, in our spiritual life or just to function and, and be able to live well and healthy and stuff like that. But sometimes we need that faith to believe to get us going. So if you're having any questions throughout the series, feel free to email pastor at Tridelphia dot org because sometimes you might just need somewhere to start and we can pray with you. If you, if you need to just start at level one. Uh, we're here to pray with you. Or if you have any questions about the lesson or any of the different th- I mean, if you want to ask us a question on the Three Angels message from like three quarters ago, feel free. Or a prophecy, that's fine. But sometimes you just need somebody to pray with. And we, we now also have the in-person prayer meetings. So if you want to join us, you can uh, also email pastor at dot org, and we can give you information on times and locations. So it's just something in the process of the Christian experience is um, thinking back to last quarter. It doesn't matter if you've been a disciple of Jesus for three years, walking physically with Jesus. Peter failed. We have those low points. We have those those times where things are challenging and we just need um, our brothers and sisters in the world to uh, pray with and to boost us up and to help us in our journey. Because the Christian experience is not something you can do all alone. You need Jesus to help you in that process. John, John 5. So we move on to another element here. If you want to start reading that, and uh, we'll kind of go every other verse again. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty-eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been in that condition for a long time. He said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. Yeah, goosebumps. That's such a great story. Um, so we have this pool, and there's this kind of superstitious kind of thing that happens where the water ripples and everything, and then whoever gets in the water first, boom, they're healed. Yeah. So it's kind of like it's like magic. It's like something that. So like whatever the case is, um, whether it was like um, kind of like the superstitious way of getting healed that somebody may be pursuing in this day and age. It's just like. Whether it was working or not, it's not quite known. However, because it was such a well-known thing, you have sick people from all over the country there. And, of course, the person who has a finger issue is going to be able to jump in way easier because they can jump in the water first. Um, This poor man, I don't know, I guess he didn't, like... He couldn't move, and I guess maybe he had arranged with other people to be there, but look, friends are fantastic, but I can't ask a friend to sit with me by a pool 24-7 for like three months, waiting for that one special ripple. 
And so whatever the case was, this, this man is over here by himself. And 38 years is a long time. And I'm going to like totally date myself here. I'm not even 38 yet. So I haven't <laughs> lived this existence of um, how long this man had an infirmity. This was a tragic case. Um, but Jesus saw that story. He saw the full situation. And I don't know if he'd been waiting weeks to get to this point and deal with the situation. But he goes up to there and he just asks him this very, um, very deep question. Like it's a simple question, but it's like, um, it's not like, do you want to be healed? It's like, do you want to be made well? And I feel like that is such a stronger, more in-depth question than just, hey, do you want to be able to walk again? <laughs> um, it reminds me of the situation where Jesus had to specifically say, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he had just said, come forth, would that have meant that like so many others who are dead would come forth because of the power of God in the resurrection? I don't know. But one thing I know is when Jesus is asking, do you want to be made well? He's thinking about whole person care here. He's not just thinking about the physical ailment of whether it was legs, back issues, whatever, shriveled up feet, whatever the situation was, there's an atrophy of the muscles. It's not just the physical, but I believe here, this is talking about the spiritual, the emotional, all the, the, the trauma of this 38 years plus. Looks like Jesus chose the most difficult case in that pool of Bethesda. Yeah. And um, he chose the person probably who was just not knowing even if he was going to be able to make it for the following day. And he comes at the right moment. Boom. And I want to think that Jesus does the same today, Peter. He comes at the right moment. Mm. And we're open to having a conversation with him. We're open yeah. to you and maybe sharing, hey, this is the situation. I have no one who can help me. No one. 38 years. And no one can help me with my problem. And Jesus is like, okay, do you want to be made well? Yeah. And he's like, you know about my problem? <laughs> mm. yeah. Well, it's interesting because... He, I don't know if other people had asked him this before, but he was just like, sir, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool when the water stirs. So he just focused on his president, or his present situation and the situation he had been focused on for the past 38 years or however long he might have not been by the pool for 38 years. Um, but he had this infirmity for 38 years and he had been by the pool, I'm assuming for a significant amount of time. but. He's not ambulatory. He cannot walk. He cannot move himself over. I don't know if his arms were, but he just says he focused on his, his micro need. And Jesus, in spite of that, he says to him, so, so like the guy's like, I don't have anybody to put me in the water. And okay. Jesus basically just says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And the incredible thing was, is it clicked in his mind. It did made sense and i don't know if it was just seeing in the eyes of jesus that that spark of life that that thing but he was just empowered soul body body spirit and he just got up and that must have been shocking for the people who knew him who had seen him um and verse nine it's just shocking like and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And it closes with the best thing ever. <laughs> and, and that, that day was the Sabbath. And 
I I think that's just such a beautiful thing. It, mm-hmm. The lesson continues on in talking about some of the controversies that Jesus mm-hmm. faced after that. But for me, I can end there mm-hmm. because that really shows you um, how Jesus was here to make creation whole again. Mm-hmm. And that that points back to creation and Amen. at the end of creation was the sabbath day Amen. and jesus rested and um jesus is out here continuing to make humanity whole on the sabbath day and that is what the sabbath is for is for healing of soul body mind spirit so whether you're physically challenged spiritually challenged, emotionally devastated, whatever the situation is, Christ is here always to open his hand, bring you into his care, and give you that strength. Um, that's what the Sabbath is for, Ma- making us whole again. And that's kind of just really where I want to end on that. Beautiful. Um, there's one quote I'll, I'll finish off from, again, Desire of Ages. It says, Through the same faith we may receive spiritual healing. By sin we have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied or of ourselves. We are no more capable of living a holy life than was that impotent man capable of walking. Let these desponding, struggling ones look up. The Savior is bending over the purchase of his blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Will thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word, and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ. Will to serve him, and in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion, which through long indulgence binds both soul and body, Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. He will set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. And that's open to anyone. Um, Jesus is holding out his hand, asking if you would like to be made whole this Sabbath day. Um, Pastor, could you close us with prayer? God, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this beautiful message, a message of hope, a message of faith, a message that is for each one of us today. And again, Father, we reach out to you just as we are. We ask that you will give us that faith to believe, to trust your word, that we have been made whole, that we can stand up, rise, and walk. And many, I believe today, are feeling like they can't walk anymore. There's nothing they can do. They might even feel like they're a total failure. And it's been a long, long time. Father, we thank you again for Jesus and for this beautiful, beautiful um, message that invites us to follow him, to trust him, to believe that he can restore us back to health and back to life. So we thank you again, and we ask your blessing for all those watching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us as we open a new quarter on the book of John. Hope to see you next week. Take care. Happy Sabbath. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video. See you next week.